Okay. So remember what we talked about last time? We were talking about freezing pre freezing point press no freezing point and uh, boiling point. Oh, sorry, freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Uh, uh, and so this is some math to discover to 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 explain that, right? But I think that I don't really care about the math, so don't worry about that. Dang, my laser died. I'm, I must use my laser a lot. Dang. Oh no, everything's dead. I guess I'll just use a yardstick. There we go. So, um, I feel like one of those nuns. That's like, you know, you know. listen. Um, so, um, I don't really care much about the math, right? The only thing I really want you to take, take note of here on this slide is this chart here, okay? And so, um, this chart here shows how, uh, uh, shows, the uh, different solvents that you can use and how you can add things to the different solvents, right? And it will, um, it will uh, either raise its boiling point or, or uh, depress its melting point, okay? Make, it, make it, its melting point lower, right? And so, um, so the, if you look at water right here, right? Its normal boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, okay? But based on this equation, which I don't really care about you actually figuring out, but based on the equation, for every mole, right, for every mole of water, uh, sorry, not every mole of water, for every mole of solute that you put into the water, it actually raises the boiling point by 0 0.51 degrees, right? So for every mole of solute, it raises the boiling point by 0 0.51 degrees, okay? And then there's benzene here, right? You have to solute to benzene. It's not, sorry, solute, any solute. Anything that will dissolve in benzene, and uh, its normal boiling point is 80.1 degrees Celsius. But for every mole, the little m stands for mole, by the way. For every mole of solute you add in there, right, it raises benzene's boiling point by 2.53 degrees, right. So you can see how adding a lot of solute into a solution um, can make it uh, make its colligative properties really shine, as it were, right really shine. Uh, so you can see it, it doesn't take much to, for example, put uh, to, to make water's boiling point like 101 degrees instead of 100 degrees. Does that make sense? Right? So two, it'd take about two moles, for example, of salt, for example, to make water's boiling point 101 degrees instead of 100 degrees, which is, which is actually probably negligible. You probably wouldn't see that in real life, you know, but if you put a ton of salt in there, then you would. And then, so same thing happens with ethanol. Ethanol is boiling point is at negative, uh, sorry, at 78.4 degrees. And um, every 1.22 moles of a solute you put in ethanol, it go, uh, sorry, <laughs> for every mole you put of solute in there, you get an increase of 1.22 uh, uh, degrees Celsius, right? Carbon tetrachloride, chloride, chloroform, those are both uh, organic solvents. So very similar thing there, uh, but very large increases for every mole. So on the other hand, when we're looking at freezing point, though, um, for freezing point, when you add salt to it or something, it doesn't have to be sodium chloride. It could be sodium acetate. It could be anything like that, right? Uh, you put some salt in there, and uh, normal, one point, normal freezing point is 0.0, .0 degrees Celsius. But for every mole of solid you add into water, it increases the – sorry, it decreases the um, – the uh, the melting point down to one, uh, by 1.86 every single time, so I mean they can put tons of salt on the road, right? And it will make it so that the it takes a lot of energy for it to actually uh, freeze. Um, for benzene, same kind of thing, except for that one, it's a huge difference for every mole, right? And then you look at the carbon tetrachloride. Man, look at this: uh, one mole of any solute into carbon tetrachloride, and it changes by 29.8 degrees as far as its freezing point goes, right? Uh, 20, yeah, 29.8 degrees for every mole. So this, again, the important thing here is not this map up here, right? The important thing here is looking at this chart and seeing how adding a solute in the solution, right? The more it is, how it changes the uh, colligative properties. Okay. And in this case, the colligative property is uh, boiling point elevation or melting point depression, okay? So, your very first question is up here now. 
the KF of water. Oh, so yeah, the when we're talk, I forgot to say that, but I'll just say it right now. Uh, when we're talking about those those numbers that say per mole Celsius, those are called KFs, right? So the KF of water is 1.86 uh, Celsius per mole. Means that what? You notice I don't even have my iPad out, so we're not going to be doing any like real calculations today. <laughs> so it's going to be mostly conceptual. Let's think through these questions here, right? If the KF of water is 1.86 Celsius per mole, what does that actually mean, right? A 1.8 molar solution will have a slightly depressed freezing point. A one mole aqueous solution of a non-volatile solute will freeze at 1.8 Celsius lower than pure water, right? Or a one molar solution of one molar aqueous solution with a non-volatile uh, solute will freeze 1.8 degrees higher than pure water, or none of the above. Okay. I feel naked without my uh, my laser. I must use it a lot. Maybe that's why it's dead. Let's see what everybody else, what everybody thinks about this question here, right? One thing to think about this question too is that when you're doing, ow, when you're doing a freezing point depression, you're supposed to be making the freezing point lower, right? And then if you're doing a boiling point elevation, you're supposed to be making the boiling point higher, right? And so really, there's only one answer there that makes sense, okay? <clears throat> At least they're not making me sign in every single time now. Maybe it finally got the got the, the message. Did it make you guys sign in every time? Oh my god. I'm so sorry about that. There's so many things that I'm sorry about, and that's one of them. I, I spoke too soon. It's making me sign in right now. I spoke way too soon. That's okay. I'll give Ashan a, a chance to sit down while I'm trying to sign in. Scan this thing real quick, Ashan, so you can uh, you can. Uh, get credit for being here today. Did you sign did you scan it? Yes. Good. Stay signed in, yes, please. Just stay signed in. Please. I know. I know it doesn't listen to me either. That's I, exactly that's how low I am on the totem pole. It doesn't even listen to me, and I'm faculty, you know. That's how low I am on the totem pole. So eleven people today, I guess. Oh, that's wrong. Wrong one. Ooh, so many questions. So many questions. Let's see here. Ah, there it is, KF. Nine responses so far. Nine responses so far. There are how many people in here? Ten people in here today. So we still need one more person. I won't hold it against you, Oshana, if you get it wrong. You, you didn't hear my first talk. <laughs> there we go, ten people. Okay, so this is the, the, this is the distribution, right? Right here, which I kind of expected. What the hell? Excuse me. That's really not a cuss word. So is it, is it a cuss word? <laughs> the, uh, I kind of expected that it would be kind of half and half, right? But at least it was half and half with either B or C, right? It was uh, B or C. So that's, that's good news um, because it's definitely not A because <laughs> A said, you know, A said um, one molar, uh, sorry, 1.8 molar, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I just made that up, okay? So the answer here is actually going to be B, right? Yeah, and it's going to be B because if you have a 1.86 Celsius per mole KF, right, um, it means that you'll lower the boiling, sorry, lower the freezing point of water, right, 
by 1.86 degrees Celsius for every one mole. See, right? Does that make sense? The reason why it's not C is because I've put higher here, right? And when you put higher there, I mean, you're not supposed to be, if you're, if you're trying to use, you freeze something, why would it go higher, right? It's supposed to be go lower. It's supposed to go lower, okay? So, at least you didn't, at least nobody picked the crazy one, I think. Okay, um, so, that takes us to talking about osmosis, okay? And osmosis is this cool thing where some substances form semi- uh, permeable membranes allowing smaller particles to pass through but blocking larger particles, right? The net movement of the solvent molecules from the solution of high to, of low to high of solute across, across the semi-permeable membrane is called osmosis, right? So basically what's happening here is that this thing right here, so you have a tube over here, right? And you have another tube over here and there's a uh, a membrane right here, and it's not permeable because permeable means it can all kinds of things things can pass through. So it's semi-permeable because only some things can pass through. Okay, and here we have a solvent, water, right? And water can pass through this membrane, right? But the solute can't, right? So let's say it's salt again. The salt can't. Okay. So here you see water particles or water molecules going through this membrane to this side, right? But you don't see any of the blue particles, which is the salt part particles, go into this side, okay? So that's called osmosis, okay? So what the point here is that all solvents, including water, have this need, right, where if they're being presented with a semi-permeable membrane, they need to be the same concentration of solute on both sides, right? So that's something called that's, that's called isotonic. Okay, so what you're seeing here, right? We have water here. It's going to we have water here, and it's going all the way over here, right? And what's happening is that at equilibrium, the flow of H2O is the same in both directions. To so so there is no net <laughs> H2O movement because it's the same concentration on both sides, right? Does that make sense? So my, so my girlfriend wanted me to tell you this. Uh, so a lot of people, and I even said this mistakenly on Monday, like to say, like, while they're studying, they'll put the book on their face, right? And they're going to learn through osmosis, right? Did you hear that before? I, I said it on Monday, actually. But she's like, she's like, you better tell them the truth about that because it's not called osmosis. It's actually called diffusion, right, when you're doing it that way. Because the big thing here, the big point here is that it has to have water. Osmosis have to have, has to have water, right? And so, for example, have you ever heard of an RO water system before? Like one of those things you use in your, your sink, your faucet to purify your water? That stands for reverse osmosis, right? And it, you can use that to purify water, right? And drink clean water, because Arlington water is nasty. I don't know about Fort Worth water, <laughs> but Arlington water is super nasty. And so, huh? It's it. Arlington water is so nasty that you you can clean your toilet right, and then the next day there will still be a ring around it. That's how dirty Arlington water is. So, <laughs> I wonder how Dallas water is. Um, what if it all comes from the same place? I don't know. But anyway, so you you if you've used uh, reverse osmo oh um, if you have one of those water filtration systems in your refrigerator, it has a filter on it, right? Like because I have a little dispenser, a water dispenser in my refrigerator, it has a little filter back there that you got to change out every like three or four months. That's also a reverse osmosis thing too. So th those are all in your 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 stuff, right? And and you, you you see how this works, right? Since only water can pass through the membrane, right? You can use reverse osmosis so you can push water across this membrane, right? And all the all the nasty stuff stays on this side, right? And the pure water stays on the on that side, right? And this is the water you drink, okay? That's the water you drink, okay? That's the water you drink. Um, so uh, then there's this thing called a. Uh, then you can apply pressure to stop osmotic. St uh, stop osmotic. It's osmotic pressure, right? Where so this is that reverse part I was talking about, right? So normally water wants to do this thing where it kind of normalizes out and has that same concentration on both sides. 
and so it's an equilibrium. But if you wanted to get water clean, right, and drink it, you could add pressure on this side. And when you add pressure on this side, that's called reverse osmosis, right? And you're pushing the water molecules back that way, and now you can drink your water. Does that make sense? So really your purification systems are like this. This is your purification system, okay? Your water purification systems. I promise, like go home, if you have one, just look on the thing, look on the filter, it'll say RO on it, and that stands for reverse osmosis, right? I bet you never knew there was so much chemistry in your real home lives, right? Keeping your toilets clean. Okay, so this is an equation, right? That I'm not really that worried about again, okay? But the thing I want you to know about, just, just so you know about, is that osmotic pressure is a collective property, right? If two solutions are separated by a semipermeable membrane, they, uh, the, uh, sorry, let me say that again. If two solutions separated by a semipermeable membrane have the same osmotic pressure, no, no osmosis will occur, right? So osmosis will occur, like I said before, when one side is more concentrated than the other side. Right, but if it's already the same on both sides, right, then it's no no osmosis is going to occur. And this equation, right, just describes that. And don't expect me to ask you to figure out any math with that equation on any test. Okay, I'm going to give you a break. <laughs> so, that's two equations now. I've said, don't worry about. Just in this slide, just in this slide today. You know, facing death really makes people think about their lives. Just so, just so you know. Okay, right, so there's three types of solutions when you're talking about osmosis. There's the isotonic solution where there's same osmotic pressures on both sides, right? Solvent passes the membrane at the same rate on both ways, right? That's, that's isotonic, 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 so both sides are the same, right? And then, excuse me, there's one, there, the other one's called hypotonic, Right, and that's lower pressure, lower osmotic pressure, right? and then so solvent will leave this solution at a higher rate than it enters it. And I'll give you an example in just a second. And then there's hypertonic solution where the osmotic pressure is higher, and the solvent will enter the solution at a higher rate than it leaves. So the first thing I want you to notice is that uh, the word iso in Greek means the same, right? So that's how you remember that when I ask you a question, is this solution isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic? If they're the same concentration, what is it going to be? Isotonic, right? Because iso means same in Greek. Hypo in Greek, right, means lower, okay? And then hyper means higher, okay? So use that, use the, the, the Greek translations of those terms to answer the questions I ask you about any kind of solution that re in regards to osmosis, okay? Just remember that, okay? All right, I'll give you an example of each one in just a second though, because we have another question. We have another question. Man, I'm just making this up. Why are you even listening to me? Just, I'm just winging it. I'm seeing what's on the slide and I'm just talking about it. <laughs> like, I don't know this stuff ahead of time, I don't think. Dang, someone went and bought hot dogs on my credit card. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it just showed up on here. Someone, it showed up. Uh, someone spent $29 at Steve Coney Island. It's got to be my girlfriend. She loves. <laughs> so I, uh, I forgot to. So I forgot, to, so this kind of stuff always, ha always happens in threes, right? So just before my grandma had her thing happen, my, my, my girlfriend's dad, who's basically my father-in-law, got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Yeah, so he's got issues too. So she, he brought, she, he's from Michigan, so he loves Coney Island hot dogs. And so that's why she went and bought a whole bunch of hot dogs for him because we just got back from Houston. And then the third person that this happened to, uh, my mom's, uh, my, my mom, I, did I ever tell you about my mom's sugar daddy? Yes. So my mom has a sugar daddy that she met online. And, and so I say that, I say that like in, in a very, uh, in a very uh, affectionate way now. Before I just thought he was a sugar daddy. But th now he's like, he really does care about my mom. And they're going to get married and all that stuff. So I call him that all the time. He's fine with it. 
because we joke. But anyway, his brother had a heart attack last night. So, yeah. <laughs> so literally, uh, my father-in-law, stage four lung cancer, grandma, uh, uh, multi-system organ failure, and then uh, my, I guess my future stepfather's brother, which would be my step-uncle, I guess that would be. My step-uncle had a heart attack last night. So, huh? Yeah, it always happens in threes. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. All right, let's see how people answer this question. Let's see how people answered this question. I, I'm sorry for uh, just loading all that on you just now. <laughs> so, but I, I feel like it's important for you to know what's happening in my life. It, it makes. I hope it makes me more approachable. Oh my gosh, I'm so so proud. I'm so proud. Everybody got it right. Yes. Look at this. I'm so proud. I'm so proud. Thank you, everybody, for getting this right. Thank you. So, oh, wait. There's only... There's, okay. There's one more person left. Look up here and make sure you pick the right one. <laughs> okay? <laughs> make sure you pick the right one. But uh, the point is, everybody got it right. I'm so glad. Okay? I'm so happy. That makes me happy. Contrary to proper belief, I do really care about your success. <laughs> so <laughs> I may be a, 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 a dick sometimes, right? But I really do care about your success. Yeah, I got to edit that one out. <laughs> but if you ever find me acting that way, don't feel free to tell me that I'm acting that way. It's just like my cursing. You know, I'm trying to turn this new leaf, and that's not working out very well. But I really am trying not to be such a, you know, a butthole sometimes. Um, so yeah, I said it in a more politically correct way. <laughs> Which of the following is, not, is true about a hypotonic solution? Yes. The answer was, I uh, forgot already what it was. C, yes, low osmotic pressure. Good job, good job. Okay. So the, the quintessential example of osmotic pressure is in cells, okay? Especially, uh, specifically blood cell. Well, it could just be any kind of cell, but we're, the example here is a blood cell. And, oh, I like this. I should use the yardstick more often. Um, so... Um, if you remember, I was telling that story about how I drank DI water tea and it made me all like, you know, paralyzed and crap, right? And so, did I ever tell you about that? Oh, that must be another class. <laughs> I have I, I have a crazy life. You don't even know. <laughs> so back in back when I was in grad school, we had this cool thing called a, a nano pure water system, right? And you think your water is clean until you get a nano pure water system, uh, because water that's tap water can conduct electricity, right? Because it has like stuff in it. So you can use DI water, which is what you guys use in the lab, which has a lot less stuff in it to the conduct electricity, right? So when you can't conduct electricity, it's called having resistance, right? And so the resistance of like tap water is like negative 20 or something like that, right? So it doesn't resist water at all. Sorry, like resist electricity at all. But DI water has a resistance of one, right? So it, it resists a lot. There's a lot of, it's pretty clean, right? That's why when you wash your dishes with distilled water, you don't get any soap scum. Uh, it's because the soap scum really is from the stuff that's in the water, not the soap itself, right? So when we're doing like these high profile type of experiments with like DNA and, and, and proteins and stuff and doing like PCR and genetic engineering, we use this stuff called nano pure water and it has a resistance of 18 mega ohms. I mean, it will not conduct any electricity at all because it's so pure. So I had the bright idea that I was going to use this water system that we had, right, to make tea. Because since it had nothing in it, it'd be so good at sucking out all the tea flavor from the tea leaves, right? And at the same time, I thought that, you know, I knew about this stuff already because I was a graduate student at the time. I, uh, I was a graduate student at the time, and so I knew about this stuff already. And I knew that you had to drink water that was a little dirty, right? Because not dirty, but had ions in it, like minerals and stuff in it. Otherwise, you'd, you know, you, know you, you have what happened to me happen. Electrolytes, right? And so I made tea out of the stuff, and it was the best tea of my life. So I drank it for like a good month, right? And like after that month, my, my arms started like going numb. My legs started going numb. I couldn't move. I was literally, people would take me to the lab in a wheelchair, and I'd lay on the table and tell people what to do in the lab because I couldn't move. Yeah. And so I went to the doctor one day, and I was like, hey, doc, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I just can't move. You know, my, 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 my limbs just don't feel, you know, right and stuff. 
And she, so she really knows me well. So she starts asking me questions about what I'm eating. And I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm eating fine, you know, usually drinking beer and eating bacon, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And she, and she goes, oh, so your normal diet, beer and bacon, right? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, exactly. And then she goes, well, what are you drinking more than just beer? I know you're not drinking all the time because you'd be drunk here now. So what are you drinking more than just beer? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm drinking tea. And she, I, I saw this light bulb pop up in her head, right? And she's like, oh, you're drinking tea? How are you making that tea? And I'm like, oh, well, I just did started this thing that's so cool, you know, because I really like tea flavor. And so I started brewing my tea with DI water. And she goes, really? Oh, no, no. I said, nano pure water. She's like, really? Nano pure water? Just just hold on just one second. Just give me one second. So she leaves the, the thing and she goes to her office and brings back a tea bag. And this is so funny because I was actually wearing a T-shirt that said that day that said, trust me, I'm a chemist, right? It's... <laughs> <laughs> and so she hands me the tea bag and she says, look at the back. I'm like, okay. So I read the back and quite literally on the back of the tea bag, it says, uh, not a sufficient source of nutrients and minerals. <laughs> right. So here I thought that, that, that the tea would replenish all the mineral, the minerals and electrolytes that was removed using the, the nanopure water system. It doesn't. Right. And so, um, <laughs> I, I, I inadvertently gave myself a disease called hypotremia. And hypotremia is a disease when you're drinking too much water, right? <laughs> yes, when you're drinking too much water. And I asked her, I think that the physical trainer there knows exactly what I'm talking about because she's laughing. <laughs> and so I asked her, what am I going to do, Doc? And she goes, just go to the 7-Eleven and get yourself a Gatorade. You'll be fine. <laughs> and literally, that's what I did. I, I, my friend rolled me out. We went to the 7-Eleven. <laughs> I drank a Gatorade, and I was better like in five minutes. Literally, like, so, so what happened there in this hypotremia disease is exactly what's happening with the red blood cells, right? When you drink water that is too, uh, too pure, right? And when you drink water that's too pure and doesn't have enough minerals in it, it makes it so that the water outside your cells is so clean and the water inside your cells is, is full of minerals, right? And so the water wants to make it all the same concentration. It wants to make it all isotonic. So literally the water was passing through my cell membranes, right, and bursting them open, bursting my cells because the, the, uh, the, it was becoming too uh, concentrated inside the cell and not concentrated enough outside the cell, right? And so that's why it's very dangerous to drink water that's too clean, number one, and then it's also very dangerous to drink too much water, right? Because that gives you, then that's what, that's in a nutshell, that's what hypotremia is. When you drink too much clean water or you drink too much water just in general and your blood cells start to like go to what they call hemolysis, they just burst because the water's flowing inside the cells trying to di dilute out all that salt inside the cells so that it's the same concentration on both sides. Because uh, absent any active transport with proteins in your cell membrane, the only thing that can pass through your cell membrane is water, right? So the salt from the cell is not going to ag exit the cell, right? It can't pass through the cell membrane. But what can go back, back and forth between the cell wall? It's the water, right? And so the water is going to go into the cell, trying to dilute out all that salt, boom, explodes. So literally all over my body, cells were just exploding because I was drinking, <laughs> like, like so especially my muscle cells, because your muscles need it the most, right? Your muscles are like, uh, they, they need calcium mostly, right, to do like um, – uh, dang it. I can't remember. Action potentials? I'm a biochemist. I should know this. Well, anyway, there's like electrical currents happening that make your muscles move, right? And the way those electrical currents like actually conduct in your muscles is with ions, right? The same way that you get electrocuted with water, right? It's the same way that electrical impulses go in your, your muscles to make, uh, to make your muscles move, right? And so if that's not available, right, and you're drinking water that's too clean, right, and there's no calcium around, <laughs> or sodium around your muscles can't the muscle the the, the your uh, myoglobin cells can't do any kind of conduction it can't move your cells it can't move your muscles so yes see and that's the thing right like it was a combination of both things my cells were bursting and then my muscles were not moving because there was no metals minerals in my blood to help the uh the process. Okay, so that's my DI water story. Moral of the story, don't drink too much water 
and don't make your water out of nano pure or your tea out of nano pure water, right? Oh, the other thing too is you know the, there there'll be these people that come to your house that tries to sell you a water purification system, and they'll have like your those they'll ask you, can I get a sample of your water? And they'll get a sample of your water, and they have their clean water that was with their purification system, and they'll put like a detector in there, and it, det it detects what they call TDS, total dissolved solids. And so they'll stick it into the water that they may, they have brought, right? And it says zero, and they'll stick it in your water, and it says like 150. And like, see, see, your water's dirty. You shouldn't be drinking this. They're actually absolutely wrong. You should be drinking that. You should not be drinking the water that they're trying to give you or make for you with their purification system because you could get hypertremia. It is all a scam, okay? <laughs> it's literally all a scam. Anyway, Ooh. off my tirade, I apologize. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here in this picture here, right? You can see that a blood cell right here is isotonic to its medium, right? And that's why, for example, a blood cell sits inside plasma, right? You have plasma with your blood because the plasma is the same salt concentration as your blood cell, right? But what can happen is that whenever it's too high a concentration on the outside of the cell, right, and the concentration is too low on the inside of the cell, the water will exit the cell, shriveling it up. And that will kill a cell too, right? That will kill a cell too. So here we have the cell, the, uh, the outside being hypotonic, hypertonic, right, to the inside, which is hypotonic. And then the water is trying to make it so that the concentration inside the cell is the same as the concentration outside the cell, right? And so it pumps water out, and it uh, eventually it'll get there, right, making this concentration higher, making that concentration lower, but in the process, you shiver up your cell, your red blood cell, and it just dies, okay? So that's a process called crenation, okay? That's called crenation. The next process is over here, and this is what happened with me and the DI water, right? <laughs> and so you have a, a solution outside the red blood cell that's lower concentration, so we call that hypotonic, right? And the concentration inside the cell is higher than the outside. It's called hypertonic, right? And so in an effort to make everything the same, the same concentration, water will start filling up the cell, and then the cell bursts open, right? So that's called hemolysis, okay? It's crazy, 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 crazy. So... Generally, we talk about it being an environment. So here you have a hypertonic environment, right? And here you have a hypotonic environment. Does that make sense, right? Yeah, so yeah, don't drink nano pure tea. It's a bad idea, bad idea, okay? So the last thing we're gonna talk about with this particular PowerPoint or this particular lecture, though we still have the kinetics one after this, but it's just the beginning, right? But the last thing we're gonna talk about in solution uh, properties is called colloids, okay? And colloids are basically things that are not solutions, like for example, salt dissolving completely in water, right? But are also not pure substances. Does that make sense? Not pure water. It's something in between. It's like a suspension of stuff, right? So good examples of, of these colloids, right? Um, for example, here, if you have a gas and a gas, uh, well, actually, a gas and a gas and a gas is always going to be a solution, right? Because they all mix together. Like you have a solution of, of nitrogen and oxygen in the air around us, for example, right? But if you have a gas and a liquid, right, that colloid is called an aerosol, right? Like your hairspray, for example, right? Hairspray is an aerosol, right? Um, these things, too, are aerosols. Like, so I have asthma, right? And so an inhaler is an aerosol, right? So... Uh, all those are called aerosols and they're all called colloids because the, the liquid didn't dissolve in the gas, it's just suspended in the gas, right? And it's suspended that way so you go, and then the air goes into your lungs and you breathe it in, right? If it was just a liquid, it just hit the back of my throat and just stay there, right? We, we need to have the, the gases go all in my lungs or I'll you know, suffocate. Does that make sense, right? Um, smoke is also one too. Smoke is actually a colloid that's a solid in the gas. So did I tell you guys I smoked a brisket this weekend, this past weekend? And when you smoke a brisket correctly, it should have a very, very dark outside, right? And the reason why it has that dark outside, that nice crust, that like I call it like the burnt ends and the nice flavorful fatty crust is because that smoke is actually solids that are dispersed in the gas and it deposits itself, it deposits itself on the brisket. And that's what that black stuff is on your brisket. And it tastes so good. If you don't do a smoke right, 
then you're not going to get that on your brisket, and your brisket sucks, right? So that's also a type of colloid. Uh, of course, we have liquid with gas, and that's like whipped cream, right? That's, I mean, how, how many times have you taken whipped cream and just squirted it in your mouth? And it feels super light, right? It feels super light and, like, frothy, you know, kind of. And it's because it's filled with air. It's a suspension of liquid with air, gases inside. Okay, that's what I call it. Milk, of course, is a is a uh, uh, is a uh, colloid as well. It's a special type of colloid called a emulsion, right? Because when you look at milk, I mean, it looks pretty homogeneous. It looks like it's all the same, but really, it's a bunch of milk fat floating around in there, a bunch of sugar floating around in there, proteins and stuff. But it's not completely dissolved, right? If it were completely dissolved, the milk would be clear. Does that make sense, right? The milk would be clear, okay? Lactose is in there too. So for people who are lactose intolerant, that's why they can't drink milk, right? But now I think they make milk that doesn't have lactose in it. So that's pretty cool. Interesting. I did not know that. Cool stuff. I mean, I'm not lactose intolerant. I mean, I drink milk all the time, but that's good to know. That's totally good to know, right? I mean, I'm a big fan of ice cream, so I can't not like drink milk. <laughs> okay, so paint... <clears throat> Another colloid, it's a solid inside of a liquid, obviously. That's what pain is. Uh, marshmallows, also oh, marshmallows, are, they're known as solid foam. So another solid foam would be like styrofoam, you know, um, like your styrofoam cups and stuff, right? And that's literally a gas inside of a solid, right? That, or a sponge is also a, uh, a solid foam or a colloid, right? Butter is a solid emulsion, right? Butter is, is uh, solids in liquids, right? Solids and liquids. And then ruby glass, which is just solid and solid, which that means is that it's glass, but it's colored, right? And that, those colors, those colored molecules are in there in the suspension. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. So there's this thing called the Tidal, 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 T Tindal, Tindal, Tyndale, whatever, Tyndall. There we go. There's this thing called the Tyndall effect, right? And what the, sorry, I'm hard of English. Um, is that even an English name? Like Tyndall? Who knows? But colloidal suspensions can scatter rays of light, but solutions do not, right? So this phenomenon is known as the Tyndall effect. The glass on the right holds a colloid, see? And it doesn't, it doesn't scatter the light. But the one on the left is a solution, right? Uh, wait. <laughs> Left, right, there we go, sorry. <laughs> the one on the left is the solution, right? So it doesn't scatter the light, right? And then the one on the right is a colloid, and that's why it scatters the light, okay? So that's how you tell the difference. Like you just take a light to it, like a flashlight, and you can see the light straight through, and you don't see this like scattering effect, then it's a solution. But if you uh, see the scattering effect, then it's a colloid. And that's how you tell the difference. It's cool stuff, cool stuff. Whew. So, which of the following is not a colloid? Which of the following is not a colloid? Ooh, I'm, I'm starting to sweat. Am I like, ooh, it's hot. I'm, Oh, there it is, colloids. Six people have responded. Six people have responded. Eight people have responded, still waiting for three or more. Ten people have responded. One more person. Still waiting for that last person. 
still waiting for that last person. Who's still working on it? Looks like everybody's done. I can only have 10. Oh, did somebody miss? It? Oh, <laughs> uh, but, but how did we have 11 before? Did someone answer more? Oh, we did? Sorry. I'm totally lost. I apologize. Um, so, 10 responses. The vast majority got it correct. It's A, right? A is the only one that is the solution, right? Because in, 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 um, um, in this list of stuff, right? We just said that milk was a colloid. We just said that whipped cream was a colloid. But, and the reason why is because the stuff that's inside both milk and whipped cream is not dissolved, right? But when you talk about salt water, is the salt dissolved or not in the water? It is dissolved, right? It literally comes apart and becomes the sodium ion and the chloride ion, right? So it's dissolved. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about in this, this, this particular stuff is the colloids and biological molecules, right? This is kind of like my, my, some of my favorite stuff in chemistry right here, okay? Um, so some molecules have a polar hydrophilic water-loving end and a nonpolar water-fearing end. Large molecules that form colloids in water have hydrophilic portions facing outward to interact with the water. So you know that when you uh, ingest things, or when you need to take vitamins, or you need to have some kind of molecule medicine or anything like that in your body, right? Not all of them are going to be water soluble, okay? And for them to actually work on you, it has to be water soluble so it can get into your cells, right? So how does your body deal with that, with molecules that are not water soluble? Well, your body, your, your body deals with that by having colloids, where one end of the molecule is loves water, and the other end of the molecule doesn't like water, right? And then you can make a molecule, make a molecule, you can do this thing called a, a micelle, right? And so it looks like this. And I'm glad I have blue here because we're talking about being water loving. Right? And so the polar side is going to be this side right here. This is like the partial... Uh, uh, let's just say this side is the polar side, right? The circles. The circles, right, is the polar side, which it likes water, right? And then the swiggly lines here, right, are the same thing as, like, for example, a fat with, you know, like that, right? So that's what that is right there. And so the, the, this part right here, the swiggly lines are the nonpolar part. Nonpolar part, okay? And so what happens is that that nonpolar molecule that's your drug will go on the inside right here. It will be safe on the inside right there, okay? But to get it to dissolve in water so your cells can access it, the outside, which is polar, likes water, can dissolve, right? So that's called a micelle. Micelle. So back when I was in grad school, I actually did research on... Uh, cyanide poisoning antidotes, and a lot of the antidotes for cyanide poisoning were actually nonpolar. So we had to come up with these micelles here, like different molecules that did this, so that we could just get a cyanide antidote into a person's body, and they actually accept it. Because it turns out that a lot of third world countries still use cyanide as a poison, so like as a weapon, right? So here on this picture here, you can see that. The outside has all this water-loving stuff. And remember, what does water-loving mean? It has uh, the ability to do hydrogen bonding, right? And so since there's all this water-loving stuff on the outside here, the part that's nonpolar can be in the center, and it can still get dissolved in the water, right? It can still get dissolved in the water because the water will dissolve uh, these hydrogen bonding-capable uh, side chains here, right? And then when those dissolve, it takes the whole thing with it. It's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool, and that's called a micelle. So, um, oh, this is, this, I just skipped the slide. What happened? Ah, there we go. So, oh, I just drew this on the board, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at it here, right? 
You can stabilize a colloid by, by absorption, right? Ions adhere to the surface of an otherwise hydrophobic chloride colloid. This allows it to interact with water, right? So here we have the hydrophobic or the nonpolar molecule in the center, right? And then all the molecules on the outside that are polar, right? And then so the water molecules can surround it. And when it dissolves it, it goes into solution. It takes it with it, see? So it doesn't show you the actual structure of the molecule there, but that's basically what I drew here, right? It's pretty neato, pretty neato mosquito, okay? But I think that the one that everybody knows the most, right? Oh, this is my, what I drew on the board, okay? I think the one that everybody knows the most, right, is um, your, your phospholipid bilayer in your cells, right? And in your phospholipid bilayers in your cells, right, it's really very similar to this, where it has a hydrophobic tail or nonpolar tail and a hydrophilic uh, head, right, which it likes water, right? And what it will do is that it will surround, it will surround uh, things that are nonpolar and help it dissolve in water. And so this is actually an example of, this is a funny thing. This is, I think this is actually sodium dodeso sulfate right here. <laughs> this is soap, right? And here's soap, right? So there's sodium right there, but here's soap. And soap is here surrounding a water, uh, I'm sorry, an oil droplet, right? So that you can wash it away in water. So that's really cool, right? That's actually soap. Right there. Okay. So there's this thing called the Brownian motion. And really all the Brownian motion says is that um, uh, molecules will float through the solution, right, in a straight path, what they call the mean free path, right, until it collides with something else, right, until it collides with something else, okay? But that's all I really want you to know about that. That's what Brownian motion means, right? So after one hour for uncharged colloidal spheres at a uh, uh, at 20 degrees Celsius, right, if you the sphere of the colloid, right, is this, right, uh, is one nanometer, then the mean free path is, uh, uh, is a um, mean free path is uh, 1.23 millimeters, right? And so the bigger the sphere, the bigger the, the point is the bigger the, the amount of stuff surrounding it to make the colloid, right, of the, those, uh, uh, those biological colloids, the smaller the mean free path, right? So the motion of the colloids due to numerous collisions with the uh, uh, numerous collisions with the much so smaller solvent, right? So that's pretty cool. That's not really a big deal, though. I wouldn't focus on this if you're studying. I'm not going to ask you anything about that, but I just have to mention Brownian motion. All right. The last thing here is this question here. Which of these is not a biological colloid? Which of these is not a biological colloid? Whew. I'm getting hot. And I'm leaving myself just enough time to give you a quick, brief thing about kinetics, and then we can go do lab stuff. This is kind of a trick question if you haven't had biology class. So don't blame you if you don't know what it is. I don't, bl I don't blame you if you don't know what this is. So don't, don't worry about it if you get it wrong. Do, 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 do. Let's see here. Let's see how everybody did. Oops, wrong way, wrong way.
seven responses so far, eight responses. We just need two more. Is anybody in cell biology right now? Or just biology in general? Okay, just wondering. Oh, you should know it then. You should know the answer. I just wrote it up here. <laughs> oh, my God. oh my God. I literally just wrote it. I literally just wrote it up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's that is i just have to say that's super funny that is super funny what because you failed to look at the board <laughs> oh my god that's too funny that is too funny um let me pull up a picture real quick for you to see why they, which what answers what here Absolutely. I'm only going to talk about kinetics for like five minutes. Don't worry about it. Okay, so let's look at what everybody said. So the answer here actually is C, right? And that is the intermembrane space of mitochondria, right? Um, I, I understand why you would think it's all of them, okay? I, I understand why you think it's all of them. Uh, but definitely my cell is one of them because I just said my cell up there, all right? But I want to show you why, okay? So the mitochondria is actually structured the same way that, for example, uh, the, the – uh, ow, just hit myself with a river. Um, the same way a normal cell is made up of, right? In, in fact, there's called this – there's this theory called the endosymbiont theory that says the mitochondria inside your cell come from the fact that your cells used to be bacterial cells that don't have any kind of membrane-bound organelles. And then these bacteria came and ate other cells, and they became your mitochondria and your, your chloroplast, right? Not your chloroplast, but plant chloroplast, right? And so that's, why, that's the reason why people think that uh, mitochondria uh, have the same kind of lineage as other cells. Uh, because if you look at the intermembrane space, this is an intermembrane space right here, and there's really nothing there, right? But what does look like the cells... Uh, a cell's bi fossil, 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 no, no, that's DNA. What is it called again? Fossil lipid bilayer, right? What does look like that is the intermembrane, the intermembrane, right? The intermitochondrial membrane. See, so you see these little, little dots here, right? That's the polar side. And that little dot there is the polar side there too. And on the inside here, right, is those fatty acid tails or those nonpolar things I showed here with the micelle. So the only difference between this here and what I drew on the board is that this is a double layer, right, where you can have water on both sides, right, whereas on a micelle, you can only have water on one side, right? The inside is going to be the, uh, the nonpolar part, right? So in here, there'll be nonpolar here, but you can have water on both sides, right? So the answer was C because the intermembrane space really had nothing. But if I had said the answer was... C was inter mitochondrial membrane, then the answer would be all of them were biological colloids, right? All of them were biological colloids. So good job, whoever got that right. I think half of you did, didn't you? Yeah, about, no, a third. About a third of you got it right. So good job. Yes. Um, so that actually ends this lecture for this. Let's go talk about kinetics just real quickly, and then we'll take a break and do lab. Oh, man. Any questions while I'm switching over? Like I said, don't worry about too much about the, the math equations. I don't think I'm going to ask you any questions about the math. Uh, I just want you to know that it exists and what the relationships are, okay? So we'll do about five minutes of this stuff, and then we'll be done, because I just want you to know what kinetics actually is, right? And chemical kinetics is this. It is the speed at which a reaction takes place, okay? Um, and when you do chemical kinetics, you can actually view the change of the reactants in a step-by-step -step mechanism, okay? 
and you'll do a lot of this actually in organic chemistry, step-by-step -step mechanisms of reactions. You're not going to do it much here, but kinetics, kinetic, chemical kinetics is really studying how fast the reaction goes, okay? There are a few things that can affect reaction rates, okay? One of those things is the physical state of the reactants. Things that are solids don't react as fast as things that are like liquids, for example, because you have to have things mix, right? And solids don't mix well with other solids, right? They just kind of hit each other. Whereas liquids can mix together easily, right? And they can do a reaction. Uh, reaction concentrations. So we talked about this before with the Chatelier's principle. Remember that, right? More reactants means what? More products. Remember that? Wait, I don't know if I told you that. Did I tell you that? Oh, that was a different class. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. So the more reactants you put into a, uh, a the more reactants you put into a reaction, the uh, the faster it goes to become products. Reaction temperature, of course. I've told you this before too. I know I've said this in here, right? If you heat up a reaction, it makes it go faster because you're making the collisions between the molecules faster, right? Because a reaction really is just a molecule colliding with another molecule, and then the presence of a catalyst. Okay, and a catalyst is just something you use, right? to make the, 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 the reaction go faster. Uh, but the cool thing about a catalyst is that you don't actually use it up. It stays the same afterwards, right? So the, the, the best example of that is in the hydrogenate, hydrogenation of fats. So if someone was asking me a little while back about saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Remember that? Well, sometimes you can take a fat that is unsaturated, which means it doesn't have all, it has some double bonds in it, and you can use platinum with it and make it all hydrogenated which I'll tell you more about that later, but it becomes basically saturated, right? But platinum, you're eating your butter and there's no platinum in your butter, I promise, right? And the reason why is because you can put that platinum there, right? It does the reaction and you take the platinum out and you're eating your butter, right? It's good. And the platinum stays the same, okay? So that's what a catalyst is, right? So let's go through a couple of these real quick, all right? I already talked about this a second ago. Physical state of the reactants. Uh, the more readily uh, the re reactants collide, the more rapidly they react, right? So homogeneous reactions, gases and liquids are often faster, and solids are slower, like I just said, because, you know, you, you throw two solids together, like you, you throw this podium against this table here, it stays the same, right? It doesn't react. So, <laughs> yeah. And then reaction concentrations, right? Increasing the reaction concentration will also... Uh, increase the reaction rate. It will make it go faster, right? It will make it go faster. The reason why is because there's more molecules, and more molecules means more collisions, right? So here we have a picture of steel wool heated in air, right? Where air is only about 20% of the atmosphere, right? Because most of it is nitrogen, and it burns fine. But when you put it inside of a flask and you pump it with 100% oxygen, what happens? It totally burns, right? It, like it blows up, okay? So it makes the reaction go faster. Whew. Next, right? Temperature, I've already said this before too. Temperature will also increase the reaction rate. Um, and uh, temperature, when it increases the reaction rate, is because it makes more collisions, right? And then I talked about catalysts. And this is the last slide for today, okay? Um, catalysts affect the rate, right? Catalysts affect the rate, making it faster without being involved in the overall reaction. Okay, that's the big deal right there. You can put a catalyst into the reaction. It will make the reaction faster. You can take it back out and the catalyst is still the same. That's the thing to remember about that, okay? Catalysts affect the kinds of collisions, changing the mechanisms, uh, uh, the pathway of the reaction, and the catalysts are critical in many biological systems. So whenever I'm talking about enzymes, that's what I'm talking about. They're biological catalysts, okay? So that's what, the, what kinetics actually is. And then you'll do a lot of math about kinetics next week, okay? And that ends this lecture.